The following sermon is by Matthew Henry. A check to an ungoverned tongue. The criminal we are now dealing with is pronounced by an inspired writer, an unruly evil, full of deadly poison, James 3, verse 8, and which is a very great discouragement to any attempt for the reformation of it. It is there said that the tongue can no man tame, not that it is impossible for men to govern their own tongues, but it is extremely difficult, and next to impossible, to reclaim and reform the extravagances of other people's tongues. And yet, though no man can tame this unruly evil, doubtless the almighty grace of God can. With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible, even this. And that grace, though not tied to any methods in its operations, yet ordinarily makes use of the endeavors of men, is means to accomplish and effect its purposes. Against this Goliath, therefore, we go forth to battle, though armed only with a sling and a stone, in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom it has defied, leaving the success of the attempt to him who made man's mouth, and is alone able to new make it, as he certainly does wherever he gives a new heart. And we will first mention particularly the most common and daring extravagances of an ungoverned tongue, and severally show the evil of them, designing and endeavoring by this to confirm the innocent, and especially to reform the guilty. And then we will, in some general directions, offer something toward a cure of these epidemical diseases. And God grant that this labor may not be altogether in vain. First, profane swearing is one of the common transgressions, or rebellions rather, of an ungoverned, ill-governed tongue. A sin so common that in most places it has become the vulgar dialect of all sorts of persons, with whose poisonous breath the air itself seems to be infected. And yet a sin so exceeding sinful that the tongue is therein set against the heavens. Psalm 73, verse 9, insults over and tramples upon that which is most sacred and honorable. The malignity of this sin lies especially in the prostituting of that solemn appeal, which by an oath is made to God's knowledge and justice, to the most impertinent and trivial purposes. Devout and religious swearing, when we are duly called to be sworn, is an ordinance of God in which we give to him the glory due to his name, as an omniscient, true, and righteous God. Profane swearing is a scornful and insolent contempt of that ordinance. Treading it underfoot is a common thing, and by this doing despite to him for whose honor it is intended. It is a sacrilegious alienating of those forms of speech which are consecrated to the glory of God, and turning them to a profane and wicked use. Like Belshazzar's polluting the vessels of the temple, by gracing his drunken revels with them, which fill the measure of his iniquity. It is trifling and jesting with that which is in its own nature awful and reverend, and which ought to be at all times treated and attended to with the greatest seriousness. Some accustom themselves wholly to this language of hell. All their discourse is corrupted by it. They cannot talk with you about business, nor tell you a story, nor give you an answer to the most common question, but almost every other word must be an oath. It is so familiar to them that it passes altogether unregarded, Charge them with it, and they will tell you in the next breath. They do not know that they swore. Others, with whom it is not altogether so common, yet think it no harm now and then when they are in a passion, or speak earnestly, or when they are in company with those to whom they know it is agreeable, 
to ramp out an oath, as they call it, and perhaps to multiply oaths. And by these frequent acts at length, they contract a habit and become as bad as the worst. It may be some swear under pretense of gaining credit. Nobody will believe them unless they swear what they say. And I know no wise man will believe them the sooner for it, for he that can dispense with the sin of profane swearing, which he gets nothing by, I fear will not boggle much at the sin of willful lying, especially when anything is to be got by it. Others swear under pretense of striking an awe upon their inferiors. Nobody will fear them unless they swear at them. That is, they would rather be dreaded and shunned as roaring lions and ranging bears and respected and honored as wise, sober, and religious men who make conscience of what they say and do, even when they are so much provoked. And there are many who are such hearty well-wishers to this sin that though they have not yet learned to swear distinctly and in plain English for fear of the censor, either of the law, or of their friends, or of their own consciences. Yet they venture to lisp this language, and have the shibboleth of an oath upon every occasion at their tongue's end. Though it be not swearing at large and in express terms, it is the abridgment of it. It is swearing in shorthand. They have learned to contract wicked words and to disguise them by half-words, which, as they have the resemblance of profane swearing, take rise from it and border upon it, are bad words, and at the best are idle words, for which they must give an account in the judgment, and being more than yea, yea, and nay, nay, more than bare affirmations and negations, they come of evil, Matthew 5, 37. No wise man will say he knows not what, or that which has no sense at all, and no good man will say that which he knows has the appearance of evil, and borders upon a bad sense. And now, oh that this paper might seasonably fall into the hands of the swear, the common swear, and a more cautious one, and might by the blessing of God be an effectual and happy means to convince and reform both the one and the other before the flying roll which carries the curse, which we read of as the swearer's doom, Zechariah 5, 3, and 4, come into their houses, or which is worse, into their souls to consume them. That is a roll which cannot be slighted and thrown by, as I suppose this paper will. You ask sometimes, what evil is there in swearing? Why so much ado should be made about a common form of speech and a man made an offender for a word? You plead that it hurts nobody, words are but wind. But you will not say so if you can but be persuaded seriously to weigh the following considerations and affix them in your minds. 1. Consider what an enmity there is in profane swearing to the blessed God and what an indignity is done by it to his glorious and fearful name. Would it not be justly interpreted a very high affront to a magistrate, though a man like yourselves, if you should send for him in all haste, to keep the peace, to decide a controversy, to seize a criminal, or to do any act of his office, and when he comes it is all ludicrous and a jest, and you intend nothing but to make a fool of him, and to expose him and his authority to contempt and ridicule, how would such an intolerable abuse be resented among men, especially if it were often repeated? Yet just such an affront, a daring affront, does the insolent swearer put upon God Almighty, making his truth, justice, and omniscience to attend all the extravagances of an ungoverned passion and an unbridled tongue. And the affront is so much the worse because it reflects upon his government. It profanes his crown, disgraces the throne of his glory, vilifies his judgment seat, and attempts to make it mean and contemptible, and thereby to render it questionable. And is there no harm in this? Whence can this proceed but from that carnal mind which is enmity against God, and from a rooted antipathy to him, and to his dominion. To this poisonous fountain the psalmist traces all these bitter streams. Psalm 139, verse 20. 
thine enemies take thy name in vain. It cannot be imputed either to the loss of the flesh, or to the loss of the eye, or to the pride of life. This is a forbidden fruit that is neither good for food nor pleasant to the eye, nor at all to be desired to make one wise, or bespeak one so. The sinner is not led to it by the love of pleasure, or the hope of any gain or reward. It can therefore proceed from nothing else but a spirit of contradiction to God Almighty, a contempt of his honor, and a hatred of his government. This sin, as much as any other, seems to have taken occasion from the commandment, and to have put forth itself purposely in defiance of the divine law, so that it may be questioned whether there would have been such a sin as profane swearing, if it had not been prohibited by the third commandment. Now this renders the sin exceeding sinful, and adds rebellion to it. And the swearer, being a transgressor without cause, as the psalmist speaks in Psalm 25, verse 3, is a sinner without excuse, and sins purely for sinning's sake. And thinketh this, O man, whoever you are, that thus affronts the majesty, ridicules the government, and defies the judgment of the eternal God that you shall go unpunished. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. He is jealous for the honor of his own name, and will not see it trampled upon and made a byword, as it is by every profane swearer. You would resent it if your name should thus be turned into a proverb and jested with by every idle fellow. And what then will God do for his great name, which is thus abused? Shall he not visit for these things? Shall not his soul be avenged on such sinners as these? Yea, no doubt, when the day of recompense comes, for he has said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. Number two. Consider what an evidence it is against yourselves that you have no fear of God before your eyes. Though you should indeed neither fear God nor regard man, yet why should you hang out a sign to give notice of this to everyone who passes by? What need do you have to declare your sin as Sodom, and thus publicly proclaim the devil king in your souls? Is it not enough that you harbor in your hearts a secret enmity to God and godliness? But dare you thus avow the quarrel and openly wage war with heaven? Dare you thus bid defiance to all that is sacred and wear the livery of Satan's family? Is it not enough that your hearts are graceless, and you yourselves in the interests of the kingdom of darkness, but you must be industrious to let the world know it? Your wisdom fails you indeed, if like the fool Solomon describes when you walk by the way, you thus say to everyone that you are a fool. Ecclesiastes 10.3 Number 2 Cursing is near akin to profane swearing. It's a common companion of it, and is another of the exorbitances of an ungoverned tongue. Cursing is wishing evil to ourselves or others absolutely or conditionally, a sin exceeding sinful, as great an instance of the corruption and degeneracy of the human nature, and as sure an evidence of the reigning power of Satan in the soul as any other whatsoever. Nothing is more naturally the language of hell than this. Nay, the devil himself seems to have smothered a curse implied when he said, Job 1 verse 11, According to the original, if he curse thee, not to thy face, but that which he stifled, his children speak out, wishing themselves confounded and damned, and what not if such a thing be not so. To show you the evil of it, I will only recommend two things to your thoughts. First, consider what a brutish piece of madness it is to curse yourselves. If you do it absolutely, it is of the same nature with self-murder, wishing harm to yourselves is, in effect, doing it, and is a breach of one of the first and great laws of nature, that of self-preservation. If you do it conditionally, it is of the same nature with profane swearing, and incurs the same guilt with this additional stain, 
that it is not only a mocking of God's government by a ludicrous appeal to him, but a defying of his judgment, a challenge to the Almighty to do his worst. Oh, the daring presumption of these sinners, sinners against their own heads, their own souls. The devils begged of our Savior, whose power they were not ignorant of, not to torment them before the time. But these presumptuous wretches, as if they thought their judgment lingered, and their damnation slumbered too long, pull vengeance down upon their own heads, and pray to God to damn them. And they need not fear, but they shall be heard. For so shall their doom be. Themselves have decided it. They challenge the devil to take them, and he is ready enough to seize his prey. But shall I ask you, are the arrests of devils and flames of hell such delectable things that you should court them? Or are they only the creatures of fancy and imagination that you should make so light of them? Be not deceived, God's judgment is not a jest, nor hell a sham. If you persist in this impious contempt of divine revelation, you will feel too late what you would not believe in time. If you have no regard to God, nor any concern for His honor, yet have you no good will to yourselves, nor any love to your own souls? Is it not enough that you are doing that every day which deserves damnation? But will you be solicitous to demand sentence against yourselves? It is but a moderate curse with you to wish yourselves hanged. Yet I have read of a person of quality in our own nation, who, coming to die upon the gallows for murder, publicly reflected upon it with bitter regret, that he had accustomed himself to that wicked imprecation. And now he says, I see the Lord is righteous. But as if this were a small matter, you challenge God to damn you and the devil to take you. And what if God should say, Amen? to your next curse, and immediately order death to fetch you and hell to receive you? What if the devil should be ready at the next call and take you presently? And can your heart endure or your hands be strong when God shall deal with you? Are you able to dwell with devouring fire and to inhabit everlasting burnings? Knowest thou the power of God's anger? Is your eternal salvation of such small account with you that you are willing to pawn it upon every trifling occasion and to imprecate the loss of it if such or such a thing be not so, which it is very possible may prove otherwise? How dare you thus provoke the Lord to jealousy while you canst not pretend to be stronger than he? 1 Corinthians 10.22 Woe unto you that thus desire the day of the Lord. You know not what you do. For the day of the Lord, whatever it is to others, will be to you darkness and not light. Amos 5.18 Consider what diabolical malice it is to curse others. It is the highest degree of hatred. Nor can anything be more contrary than this to the royal law of love and charity. He who prays to God to damn his neighbor plainly intimates that he would do it himself if he could. And if he who hates his brother is a murderer, surely he who thus curses him is the worst of murderers. He is a bad one, a destroyer. That tongue is doubtless set on fire of hell, which is for sending everybody there at a word, and which by cursing men who are made after the similitude of God would set on fire the whole course of nature, and is an advocate for the devil that roaring lion which seeks to devour precious souls, James 3, verses 6 and 9. Must a righteous God be summoned to execute your angry resentments, and called upon to destroy those whom he sent his own Son into the world to save, and to whom he is waiting to be gracious? Because you are out of humor, must all about you be sunk and ruined presently? as a madman in his frenzy throws about him firebrands, arrows, and death. So is he who curses his neighbor, nay, perhaps his wife, his child, his friend, and says, Am not I in passion, or am not I in sport? Have you no other way of signifying your displeasure, if it be just, but by the imprecation of evil, 
the worst of evils, which bears no proportion at all to the offense given you? Put this case close to your heart. When you wish your child or servant or neighbor hanged, confounded or damned, or sent to the devil, either you mean what you say or you don't. If you do not wish it, as I charitably hope you don't, you are guilty of a manifest falsehood and must own yourself a liar. But if you really do wish it, and what wickedness is it that will not enter into the heart of a furious man? You cannot but acknowledge yourself guilty of the most barbarous and inhuman malice imaginable, so that every curse proves you a willful transgressor, either of the law of truth or of the law of love. Consider further that the curses you are so liberal of will not hurt those against whom they are leveled, but show your ill will, for as a bird by wandering and a swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come, Proverbs 26, 2. But they will certainly return upon your own head to your confusion. As he loved cursing, so let it come to him, into his bowels like water, and like oil into his bones. Psalm 109, 17 and 18. They who are called to inherit the blessing are commanded to bless and not to curse. Romans 12, 14. Believe it, sirs, curses are edge tools, which it is dangerous playing with. In your furious and outrageous cursing of the brute creatures, or that which is inanimate and incapable of the harm you wish it, what is lacking in malice is made up in folly and absurdity, like that which the apostle calls the madness of Balaam, when he wished he had his sword to kill his own ass with. By such silly, nonsensical curses as you sometimes throw about in your passion, you make it to appear that with your religion you put off common sense. You are men who are rational creatures. Speak with reason, then, and act with reason. And be ye not as a horse and a mule that have no understanding, as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. Number three. Lying is another of the exorbitances of an ungoverned tongue and a very pernicious one. It has been said of some that though they do not swear, yet they will lie. It is to be feared there are those of whom it is too true, and let them bear their own burden. But let not those who would not for a world do either suffer for the same, nor let swearers think it will in the least excuse their sin that they are liars who are no swearers. It is certain they are both damning sins and either of them persisted in will undoubtedly be the ruin of the sinner. But if we may guess at one sin by another, it is more probable, as I hinted before, that they who make no conscience of swearing will not stick at lying. And we may charitably hope, unless we know the contrary, that they who dread a profane oath will be as much afraid of telling a willful lie. Let me therefore in God's name seriously apply myself to those who, as a prophet speaks, have taught their tongue to speak lies, Jeremiah 9, verse 5. For there is an art in it, whether there be such lies as seem to do good, or such as are directly intended to do hurt, or such as are idle and intended neither for good nor hurt. If there are lies, there are sins against God, and all liars shall have their portion in the bottomless pit, if they don't repent. And the nice distinctions with which they think to justify, or at least excuse themselves, will prove in the great day but a refuge of lies, which the hell will sweep away. Isaiah 28, verse 17. A few words, one would think, may serve for the conviction and discovery of these sinners. Sure, you need not be told what lying is. Your own consciences will tell you, if they be not seared or bribed or forbidden to deal plainly with you. In your bargains and contracts, if you say that, either for selling the dear or buying the cheaper, which you know to be false, it is a lie. Yet how common is it, in the multitude of those words, for the seller to call the commodity good and cheap, 
and to aver that he gave so much for it, when he knows that it is neither so nor so. And a buyer in his bidding will call that worthless and dear, which he has no reason to call so, and will say he can buy it cheaper elsewhere when he does not know that he can. It is not, it is not, saith the buyer, but when he has gone away, then he boasts of a good bargain, not considering that he is helped to it by a lie. Proverbs 20, verse 14. In your excuses, which you make, either to superiors or equals, if you deny, extenuate, or conceal a fault by representing a thing otherwise than it was, though you may gain your point and not be so much as suspected of falsehood, yet the guilt is nevertheless. When you are charged with any neglect or injury, you are ready to say you did not know or did not remember. That which you are conscious to yourselves you did know and did remember. You plead that you thought or intended so-and-so when really you did not think or intend any such thing. These are the common refuges of those who are culpable. Because the profession of a man's thoughts and purposes is not easily disproved. But though men cannot convict us of falsehood in those professions, he that searches the heart can. Men may be shammed with a frivolous excuse, but God is not mocked. In your commendations of yourselves or others, if you give a better character than you know there is cause or ground for, if you boast of a false gift and represent your abilities, possessions, and performances to greater advantage than they deserve, and then the truth will bear, though these may pass for innocent hyperboles with those who take the same liberty themselves, Yet your own consciences will tell you, if they are faithful, that by this you add the sin of lying to the sin of pride, than which there are not two sins that God hates more. In your censors, if you put false constructions upon the words and actions of your neighbors, making a great crime of that which was nothing or next to nothing, unjustly aggravating their faults and making them worse than they really are, or representing that as certain which is but suspected and doubtful, much more if it should prove that you lay to men's charge things that they don't know, and by this you involve yourselves in a double guilt, falsehood, and uncharitableness. In your promises, if you engage that, you will do so and so, pay such a debt or finish such a piece of work within such a time, or do such a kindness for your friend when either you do not at all intend it, or foresee you cannot perform it, or afterward take no care either to fulfill the promise when it is in the power of your hand, or if disabled to do that in due time to recall it, by this there is guilt contracted, either the promise should not have been made, or it should have been kept. In your common reports and the stories you tell for discourse sake, and a keeping up of conversation, if you report that is true and certain which you know to be otherwise, and do not make conscience of representing everything as near as possible to the truth, and to your own sober thoughts you become transgressors. Sure, there need not many words to persuade you to repent of the sin and carefully to watch against it for the future and all the appearances of it. Consider how contrary it is to God. It is a breach of His law. It is a defacing of his image, for he is a God of truth. And it exposes us to his wrath, for lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. Consider how conformable it is to the devil, and how much it makes you to resemble him, for he is a liar, and a father of it. It is an injury to your brother, not only to the particular person who perhaps is wronged by it, but to human society in general. And it will be the ruin of your own precious souls if you persist in it. They who thus do the works of the devil shall have their portion with the devil and his angels. A lie is soon told and perhaps is soon forgotten, in a light manner made of it. But the punishment of it will be everlasting in a lake that burns with fire and brimstone, out of which there is no redemption." Number five, lewd, obscene, and filthy talk is another of the vile exorbitances of an unsanctified, ungoverned tongue. 
It is a thing to be greatly lamented. It is a thing greatly to be lamented that this impudent sin, which bids open defiance to virtue and honor, and wages war with them, like a spreading leprosy stains the beauty of our land, turns a Canaan into a Sodom, and has become an epidemical disease. For the relief of those who are infected with it, and are not incurably unclean, I would in a few words show you the evil of it first. Consider what an offense it is to the pure and holy God, who takes notice of and is much displeased with the uncleanness of your lips, as well as of your hearts and lives. It is a violation even of the law of nature, which prescribes modesty and teaches us to blush at everything that is immodest. The law of Moses provided for the keeping up of this hedge of chastity, and in many instances punished that which broke through this hedge. The law of Christ is very express against all filthiness and foolish talking and jesting, and appoints that fornication and all uncleannesses should not be once named among Christians without the greatest abhorrence. Ephesians 5, 3 and 4 And is the law of Christ nothing with you? Can you go directly contrary to it, and yet hope to prosper? God has told you plainly there, verse 5, that such unclean persons have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. In verse 6, that because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. And you cannot suppose that the fixed laws of heaven should be dispensed with to gratify your base lusts. The law of Christ shall either rule you or judge you. Secondly, consider what an evidence it is against yourselves that you are possessed by the unclean spirit and are under his power. Out of the abundance of the filthiness that is in the heart, the tongue speaks thus filthily. And from that root of bitterness arises this gall and wormwood. The abominable lewdness that is in the heart and is harbored and indulged there boils up in this noisome dross, stinking breath as a sign of putrid lungs. While you please yourselves and your companions with this dirty language, you do but foam out your own shame and sport yourselves with your own deceivings. You think you show your wit by it, but indeed you show your wickedness and declare your sin as Sodom. And those who are not ashamed and cannot blush, chastity and modesty have been virtues, are so and will be so, how much soever they are despised and disdained by the first-rate sinners of the age. And that which is a virtue is a praise, is an honor, which if you lack, yet you need not proclaim that you do so, nor be proud of your shame. Unclean thoughts may, through the infirmity of the flesh and for lack of watchfulness, come into the minds of those who disallow them, lament them, and strive against them, knowing that even these thoughts of foolishness are sin. But unclean discourse is much worse and more exceeding sinful, for by this you signify your approbation and allowance of those unclean thoughts. You put an imprimatur to them and consent to the publication of them for the common service of the devil's kingdom. Number three, consider what a great deal of hurt it is likely to do to others. Though the sin does not so immediately reflect upon the blessed name of God as swearing does, and therefore has not so much malignity in its nature, yet it does more toward the corrupting of the minds of others, and the propagating of vice and wickedness, and perhaps any other tongue sin whatsoever, and so is more mischievous in its consequences. Such tender is the corrupt heart of man to these sparks, that one unclean word to an unguarded soul may be the unhappy occasion of a thousand unclean thoughts, which may produce a world of iniquity, if this root of bitterness thus spring up and sprout forth, thereby many are defiled, Hebrews 12, verse 15, more than perhaps you are aware of. And your account in the great day will rise high if you must be answerable for all that uncleanness which has been spawned in the minds of others by your lewd talk. Filthy stories and songs and jests are the pestilential breath of hell which propagates the infection of sin 
old Satan's wiles by which he betrays unwary souls into their own ruin. And those unclean lips which help to lay those snares are factors for the unclean spirit. And by debauching the minds of others with their vile discourses, perhaps serve the devil's kingdom in the interests of it as effectually as those who debauch the bodies of others with their vile adulteries. Evil communications corrupt good manners. If those who hear your lewd talk be not so bad as to be infected by it, certainly they are as good as to be offended at it. He is unfit for civil company and breaks the law of good manners who takes a pleasure in saying that which a wise and good man must frown upon and hear with shame or with an angry countenance. What Mr. Cowley says of lewd poems is, with a little alteration applicable to lewd discourse, tis just, the speaker blush, there, where the hearer must. That discourse is but bad entertainment, which occasions either guilt or grief to all that hear it. Therefore, let all who have accustomed themselves to this language be persuaded to leave it off, and henceforward to set such a careful watch before the door of your lips, that they never more offend thus with their tongue. And if at any time they think this evil, let them lay their hand upon their mouth. Proverbs 30, verse 32. Let it go no further. That mirth is dear bought, which is purchased at the expense of the favor of God the honor of virtue and the purity and peace of our own consciences. Better lose your jest and lose all these jewels. Dread the consequences of it not to others only, but to yourselves. Those who allow themselves in the transgression of the laws of modesty, it is to be feared, will not long be governed by the laws of chastity. The way of sin is downhill. And let me bespeak all who are well-wishers to religion and virtue, not only to be very cautious themselves never to say anything that looks like lewdness or looks toward it, but in all companies to contrive how they may put this vice to the blush, expose it to contempt and dash it out of countenance. They who would approve themselves strictly modest must never seem pleased at the hearing of that which is otherwise, nor laugh at an immodest jest or story, lest they should have fellowship with these unfruitful works of darkness, which ought to be frowned upon, and reproved rather. Let it be seen that you can be merry and wise, merry and modest. Reckon it to be a burden to dwell among a people of unclean lips, Isaiah 6, 5. And pray to God that according to his promise, Zephaniah 3, verse 9, he would turn our people to a pure language that we may be fit to call upon the name of the Lord. Having thus mentioned some of the vices of an ungoverned tongue, especially those that are most common, such as are openly profane, and given some particular hints of arguments against them, I shall now close with some general directions for the reducing of the exorbitant power of an unruly tongue first. See that your heart be truly and thoroughly sanctified by the grace of God. If you would have the disease cured, you must lay the axe to the root and meet it in its causes. The peccant humor within must be purged out. Else these eruptions, though they may be checked for a time by external restraints, yet will never be healed. The right method prescribed by the great physician is first to keep your heart with all diligence and then by that means to put away the forward lips. See Proverbs 4, verses 23 and 24. The way to heal the poisonous waters is, like Elisha, Second Kings 2, 21, to cast salt into the spring, make the tree good, and then the fruit will be good. It is out of an evil treasure in the heart that evil things are brought. Men speak slightly of God and spitefully of their brethren because they think so. Let but the thoughts be rectified, and the language will be soon reformed. If the law of love to God and your neighbor were written in your hearts, and you were, as you should be, actuated and governed by these as a living commanding principle, you would not dare to offend either the one or the other with your tongue. That good treasure laid up in the heart would bring forth good things to the use of edifying, which would manifest grace in him that speaks and minister grace to the hearers. The fear of God always before your eyes will be an effectual restraint upon you from saying that by which either his name is dishonored 
or is law violated? The grace of God is a coal from the altar, which if it touched the tongue, the iniquity of it will be purged away, Isaiah 6, verse 7. Let the throne of Christ be set up in your hearts, and his love shed abroad there, and then you will not call it a needless preciseness to be thus careful of your words, but a necessary strictness, because by our words we must be justified or condemned. Then you will not call it a task and a slavery to be thus tied up, and a speak by rule, but an honor and a pleasure. For assuredly this blessed change, wrought in the soul by the renewing grace of God, will open such surprising springs of present joy and comfort, as will abundantly balance all the uneasiness which corrupt nature will complain of in these restraints. Solemnly resolve against these and all other tongue sins. Let holy David's vow be yours, and bind your souls with it this day. I will take heed to my ways, that I sin not with my tongue. And remember, as he does there, that you have said it, that you may not break your promise. Psalm 39, verses 1 and 2. Well, the result of your convictions is no more but this, that you hope you shall govern your tongues better for the future, and that, for aught you know, you will not swear so much as you have done, and in the mind you are in you will not speak so many idle, filthy words as you have spoken. If this be all, you leave room for Satan to thrust in with his temptations. Faint purposes are soon shaken and proved to no purpose. But when you are come to a point and without equivocation or mental reservation, will solemnly promise that by the grace of God you will never swear nor curse any more. You will never take God's name in vain any more. You will never speak a lewd or scurrilous word any more. This fortifies the stronghold against a tempter who, like Naomi, Ruth 1 verse 18, when he sees you are steadfastly resolved, will leave off speaking to you. Renew this resolution every day, especially if you have a prospect of any occasion which will be a more than ordinary temptation to you. Thus set a guard upon the door of your lips, and at some times double your guard, where you find yourselves weakest and most exposed. Try the strength of your resolutions, and do not for shame suffer yourselves to be baffled in them. Only remember to make and renew these resolutions and the dependence upon the grace of Jesus Christ, which alone is sufficient for you. Peter resolved against the tongue sin and his own strength, but it failed him, and he was made ashamed of his confidence. Confide, therefore, in divine strength only. Next, keep out of the way of bad company. Speech is learned by imitation, and so is corrupt speech. We are apt in discourse to conform to those with whom we associate, and therefore if we would keep those commandments of our God, which relate to the government of the tongue, we must say to evildoers, depart from us, Psalm 119, verse 115. Don't converse familiarly and of choice with those who accustom themselves to any evil communication, lest you learn their way lest you learn their words and get such a snare to your souls as you will not easy disentangle yourselves from. If you love your souls, therefore, be very careful what company you keep. Choose to converse familiarly with those to whom you may learn that which is edifying, and by whose discourse and example you may be made wise and better, and avoid the society of those by whom, without a greater degree of wisdom and watchfulness than you can pretend to, you will certainly get hurt to yourselves. Improper words are sooner learned than unlearned. Think twice before you speak once. We often speak amiss because we speak in haste. When that comes out which comes uppermost, what can it be but froth and dross? Moses spake unadvisedly with his lips, not consulting with himself before he spoke. And then he said that which shut him out of Canaan, what we speak in haste, we often find cause afterwards to repent of at leisure. David more than once reflects with regret upon what he said in his haste, and we have all a great deal of reason to do so. A Check to an Ungoverned Tongue by Matthew Henry